I think that my only challenge to you would be if, if you don't like the political culture there, then to be active in it. It doesn't necessarily mean to be active on the election side. It could mean mm -hmm. connections with your whatever your elected officials are and helping them. A lot of them are they're wanting support to to be able to create more enlightened policies. And so, you know, I've, I've been trying to reach across um, I built bridges on the left and uh, and and some on the right now. I've, I got books. I got my book to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, as well as to Michael Steele on the Republican side. Um, various senators. I, I just signed one that somebody's going to bring to Justin Trudeau. Um, some pol <laughs> British <laughs> fantastic. So, so I, I, yeah, I'm trying to build bridges on both sides. And you know, and I think that that's part of the growing edge for the spiritual movements is yeah. to say, listen, if we really believe that we are operating from a more unitive perspective, which I think we are, then it's imperative that we begin to help translate that into our political system, because otherwise the world is gonna be suppressed by this war culture that's actually not leading to better solutions or a healthy demonstration of what a loving culture looks like. And that gets templated in at a very young age of our children. So we can create our little bubble worlds, but really shifting the, the, the big political game is the most powerful way to create lasting change. It's just harder work. And you got to You're listening to Karen Swain, to teacher of deliberate creation, the accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Clap along if you feel like that's what you Hello want. and welcome to another fascinating conversation. Awakening Consciousness with Open Hearts and Inspired Minds. You're listening to Karen Swain on Accentuate the Positive for Soul Traveller Radio. And I'm so delighted to have Stephen Dynan, the CEO of The Shift Network and author of Sacred America, Sacred Worlds. Welcome, Stephen. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Karen. So... Obviously, you've written this book. I, I, um, look, the Shift Network is amazing, and we're going to get into you know what the Shift Network's all about. It sort of speaks for itself. There's a shift, and anyone who's attracted to my interviews knows what that's about. But you've written this book, which is about the political environment that's happening in your country, and I've heard you say that be you know you're showing the way for the world. America is showing the way for the world. So as you shift the political environment or enlighten the political environment in America, the world will follow suit. Is that how you feel? Uh, I wouldn't say just like that because that makes it seem like it's only the U.S. that's leading the way forward. I would put it a little different. I would say it's very difficult for the world to go to the next level of awakening and reunification and peace and prosperity until the United States does because we wield so much power and influence in the world. So it's particularly imperative that we figure out how to make the American political system reflect a higher consciousness and to fulfill a higher destiny, which is ultimately not just about America, but about really a service to the larger world. And I think that's been coded in the uh, DNA of our country from the beginning. And uh, just so folks, you know, have a little bit of relevance, and part of what I would love to see happen is that it's not just a single book, Sacred America, Sacred World, but that other countries take on a project of what's their unique contribution to the larger shift. So I, I'm gonna be talking to some people in Slovakia of all places who wanna do a sacred Slovakia, sacred world, and there could be a sacred Australia, sacred world. Because the deeper, the deeper recognition is that we do, that literally everyone and everything is sacred, that we've been entrusted with this beautiful planet and that we have each have a unique um, dharma or destiny within that, but countries do as well, a larger contribution to make to the healing, evolution, growth of our world. Yeah, well, absolutely. Look, I'm, you know, you've got a fan here. You, I'm, you're not going to get any argument from me. But it's been so fascinating watching what's been going on in the States. You know, the polarization of the parties as the rest of the world looks on. You, you know, I'm somebody that do, doesn't watch the news, doesn't buy newspapers, but you can't, you know, it comes through the Facebook feeds. It comes through social media. You can't help but watch what's going on in the political environment in the States at the moment. And it's, you know, it's crazy, but it's fascinating at the same time. It's so entertaining. It's so entertaining. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> it's so if, entertaining. If, there wasn't, if the stakes weren't so high, we could just sit back and be entertained by it. But the stakes are high also for us to get it right. So as we have this interview, it's August <clears throat> 2016, and you go to election. When do you go to election for the presidency? No, yeah, November 8th or 9th, I think it is. So it's looming. And what do you think, what do you feel will happen? Okay, so we have these candidates, these two 
polarized mainstream runners that everyone's giving their attention to when I say everyone that the media is giving attention to and that is at this stage uh, Hillary Clinton and Trump can't even think of his first name (laughs) Donald Donald sorry Donald (laughs) what do you think is going to happen well I think what's happening is in many ways we're um we're seeing an exaggeration of a lot of the old patterns, particularly on the Trump side of the kind of the old school alpha male patriarchal kind of dominant energy. And then there's a part, you know, in it, when people have a lot of fear that we we revert back to what we know and what feels safe. And so there was a tendency uh, to sort of revert back to who seems like the most alpha dominant male in, in the Republican primaries. But now the Republican Party is sort of having to be faced with a having a candidate who's embodying a lot of things that they, they no longer want to be seen as. They don't want to be seen as the white man's party. They don't want to be seen as marginalizing and racist or misogynistic. And, there, and there, so there's a way in which Trump is like surfacing a lot of shadow dynamics for the Republican Party. And so my sense is that what's going to happen is that there's going to be an inc- kind of increasing implosion of that. And I think that it's going to lead, lead, lead them to lose very badly. And in that process, I think, have to do a sort of a, a maturing rebirth, if you will. And I, I, I believe that part of the thesis of my book is that uh, you actually need conservative and progressive polarity for a country to evolve. You need a healthy conservative movement and a healthy progressive. But when they're not really working synergistically with each other, if it's just a warfare, then you end up diminishing uh, and there's more and more entrenchment on each side. So we actually need a more enlightened Republican Party, and Trump, in his own way, is going to be the catalyst for the birthing of that through, I believe, a a sort of a pancaking loss. Um, And we also, you know, there are plenty of people who in my orbit who are not fans of Hillary Clinton, but I think she has many uh, admirable qualities as a leader, and she, she does bring in certain dimensions of the feminine that I think are important to bring into the psyche of America. Now, Amer- the American psyche, part of where we're out of balance as a country is that we have a very martial um, climate and, and culture. And so it's like, you know, between American football and, you know, ultimate fighting challenge, there's there's a celebration of violent means and, and the strong masculine, and it's gotten out of balance. And it's partially partially what needs to be rebalanced in the American psyche is to, is to have more of a masculine feminine balance. So we're kind of seeing this exaggeration between like the old school alpha masculine, the new feminine coming in, and then they're just come completely at war with each other. Their hatred, I mean, the, the level of hatred on both sides, not just at the leadership level, but among followers is really fierce right now. And so it's kind of like some people say it's like sort of popping the pus of an old wound or something. It's like there's a, there's a way in which all this kind of psychic mess that we haven't dealt with as a country is getting surfaced. And it's going to be ugly. And so part of what um, part of what I think spiritually oriented or healing oriented people need to do is to help to hold the whole right now to like, not just see who's going to win the election, but to also reweave the American family together. Because while this uh, level of uh, explosion of the of the id, if you will, of our culture happens, it, it can really degenerate into more violence. And so we actually have to some of us have to be holding the, the beauty and the complementarity of different political positions. Uh, I'll give you an example. Right before Cleveland, the Republican uh, National Convention, uh, a nun named Sister Rita Petrizulio and some other Sisters of St. Joseph had the idea to have a circle the city with love. So they got eventually 4,000 people together to create this giant circle across a major bridge uh, called the Hope Memorial Bridge. And people of all faiths, all skin colors, even the police participated for half an hour of just sending love into the city. Wow. So instead of, um, they were anticipating up to a thousand arrests a day, they were prepared for riots. And instead there was a block party, <laughs> you know, it's sort of a, it was very, it was nonviolent. There was only five arrests a day in, in Cleveland. And so it's, you know, you can't say it's like, this is exactly what caused that to happen. But I think that it did help soften something so that, so it didn't de- descend into violence. So, so while we're surfacing a lot of the, the negativity that's been in the psyche, it's, it's surfacing also around patriarchal patterning. It's also surfacing about, about the, the strong feminine. So it's like the, a woman who wants to be the most powerful person in the U.S. that brings all kinds of subliminal stuff up to the surface. And so there's this kind of like massive uh, purging of deeper shadow issues right now. And so we kind of, you know, like 
when that's happening, when if that happens in a relationship, you need a therapist in a way to hold the space for people to work through stuff. And so there's a bit of that need in the United States right now to hold the space for the two parties to work through all of this darkness and shadow and get uh, get to the other side, which I believe I believe what will happen is that Hillary Clinton will be elected president and that that is going to force a kind of rewiring in our psyches around the feminine in in American culture. So by having the most powerful person be a woman, even if she's, you know, has a stronger masculine side than a lot of women, it's like there's still a way that that shifts the dynamics in terms of like what's possible and also shifting the culture. Because even though she has a kind of a fairly aggressive reputation, she's known as a real listener too. She really listens to people and really integrates her feedback and she builds um, a lot of collaborative bridges. So I think she, she'll bring a different spirit into how, how the president, president's office works, or how the White House works um, than perhaps any other president too. So anyway, I think it's sort of like a, it's like a death rebirth moment for, for the American political culture. And it's, and it's entertaining, but horrifying at times. And then also, I think there is this redemptive quality to it, too, that I, I believe that we are going to be kind of break it through to another level of health on the other side. But it requires keeping everybody in the ring, making people sure, pe sure people feel loved and appreciated. I spent time at both the Republican and the Democratic National Conventions to build more bridges and to, to do what's called transpartisan political work, which is grounding in our identity as citizens, American citizens or global citizens, rather than just our party identities. And I still have, I still, you know, I'm still, I'm not a Trump supporter. I, I support Hillary Clinton, but I'm more in the foreground is, is about what do we, how do we actually bring people together, respect different political voices as part of the diversity that strengthens us and do what I call political cross training to step out of our own positions and think about issues from multiple uh, different perspectives, and that leads to better solutions. So I, I, I see it as a kind of a bringing a spiritual practice into the public sector, which is, which is part of how we evolve our public sector. Well, absolutely. Gosh, there's so much I could say to all that. <laughs> but, uh, look, uh, you, you, said, did you, oh, you said so much and all that. You said that, you know, if Hillary wins, you think that she will, that um, she'll bring that feminine uh, aspect into the most powerful job. Do you think that Obama did that with being an African-American? Did, did. Did, did, did some healing happen in that divisive nature that we have on this planet? You know, and uh, Because, you know, here's the thing. This is what we do with our politicians. We love them, we vote them in, and then we shoot them down. Well, you know, there's nothing that they can do right. I, I, and that's... Well, the basic... Uh, Barack Obama is now sort of enjoying a resurgence of popularity. I think given the political climate now, he has higher approval ratings than any time in his second term. And so I think he's, history is going to see him very favorably. And part of what I think has happened is some of our covert racism got brought to the surface in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a lot of African Americans who feel like it was tough to have him as president because a lot of people that they didn't necessarily think of as racist would say racist things about him. Like, there's something when, like it's a power dynamic, when, when all of a sudden someone has power over us, sometimes the, the worst parts are going to surface in relation. So I, I think in some ways there, there's been more overt racism in the in, uh, United States in the last eight years, partially triggered by the, the fact that we've, we have finally elected an African-American as president. But I think in the long run, it does actually heal and you know it has it's been a major glass ceiling that's broken it's been healed a historical um you know something a, a real breakage point in our in our heart and and does does has done a lot to start to bring us to the end of the era of discrimination now we obviously still have a long way to go but i think that post president uh, i think that uh, barack and michelle will be seen very favorably in the culture they're already you know, beloved by a lot of people, particularly Michelle, and I think they're going to be able to be continue to be catalysts for more and more of the healing because the power dynamic will no longer be part of it where there's a resentment that it's like, oh, the Democrat's in power and he's a black man. And so there's there's some subliminal anger about that uh, that, that then surfaces versus like he's he and Michelle are more of a healing, pure, purely healing force and uplifting force. But, you know, it's like the, the tricky thing is it's like uh, evolution doesn't always it doesn't go through big jumps. It's like we have to kind of inch by inch make progress. I was at the, D the Democratic National Convention and spent a lot of time with the LGBT leaders. And in 1972, there was only one out 
uh, gay delegate to the to the Democratic convention. And this year there were 700 and uh, 28 who were trans. And so it's been this huge strides have been made uh, in really my lifetime around LGBT and moving to gay marriage and the level of equality and politicians now are out that are gay, including one in the Senate. So there's a very, uh, there's been huge momentum there. And just to see it from the wide angle lens that these, the shifts are happening, but they often, they, they can they can look really, um, you know, uncomfortable and, and sometimes ugly for a while. Yeah, look, I agree. It's a very enlightened view. I love I love your view on what's going on. And, and I, um, I do agree with you. I've been, you know, I've been thinking, everyone's been damning Trump and I've been thinking he's doing a really good job of being Trump and being what he's supposed to do. And this is how I saw, see him. It's kind of like when Seinfeld brought out, you know, the Seinfeld comedy and he exaggerated all those little things that we have within us that are ridiculous but we don't see it until we see it in somebody else in an exaggerated right. way it's like i broke up with that person because they picked their nose it's you know i could throw away a relationship but i mean that was the comedy of seinfeld and that's like trump he is doing that too it's okay right. for a man in the pub to say these racist crazy stupid things but for a person who's running for president you know and you dismiss that stuff but you can't dismiss it when it's somebody running for president. And so he's doing a great job of showing us our prejudices, our dark side, things that maybe we don't even know that we hold until we see it in somebody that's you yeah. know, running for president. And we go, that's just And part of, my theory, part of my theory is that I think that he's, his campaign has actually been, appeared to be more racist and misogynist and, than he actually is. And, I'll, and, and, uh, and yeah. actually, and the reason I think for that is that because he's a showman, because he and he has an instinctive uh, impulse to go where the energy is blocked, you know, like a comedian will tend to go into where's the part that we don't want to face, and then and then that when we laugh about that, it opens up the energy energy that's blocked there. Yeah, yeah. And so Trump, in a similar way, he starts yeah. playing with the audience and working the audience, and so yeah. he's getting feedback. He's getting a feedback loop, and so he'll keep going further and further because it's opening up more energy. And that energy that's been suppressed is often under the lid of what's called political correctness, which basically means that we're trying to suppress some of these less evolved states rather than let them evolve through their own process. It's like, okay, we're going to shut down people's truth around maybe they are racist, maybe they are misogynist, but then they can't say that, so then it's just kind of in the shadows. But he, see, he feels that instinctively, and he calls it out of the audience, and he mean, meanwhile becomes a more and more of a caricature of the, the id of the... Um, of, uh, the, of his supporters. Yeah, exactly. And he's doing a great job at that. I mean, and he has a great... a masterful job at that. <laughs> and I, and I, don't, I don't feel that deeply triggered by him the way, like, you know, I feel like, I feel like he is, he is uh, an expression of what we're outgrowing. And yeah, I think exactly. ultimately going to be that we need to vote it down, not simply shame it out of existence. It's like, we need to vote the higher path. We need to, demonstrate that we are rising above certain of our baser instincts. Um, and uh, Okay, so. okay. So this is a question I want to ask you. Um, I, I read when I was reading your book that you were or are a Republican or were a Republican. Before. No, I'm, I never actually have been, but I've been, um, what I've been interested in is what I call integrating my inner Republican. So in order oh, okay, to launch okay. the Shift Network, you I, I was reading your book last night. You were talking about how you embrace more conservative views than you did maybe when you were younger and you can see yeah. how. But this is the question I, I want do, to ask I you. Feel like, what I, I kind of feel like now is each political, um, system, political worldview is like its own value system. It tends to prioritize certain values and and um, and not as much other values, and so it's like it's like when we travel to different cultures. If we travel to Spain, oftentimes I'm more gregarious, I'm funnier in Spanish, in certain ways because it's like a different personality, and the culture evokes that. So funny, part of what I, I, I find is interesting if you think about different political orientations as value systems, we want to actually integrate the best of each value system. It gives yeah. us a fuller spectrum, yeah. and sometimes in business, a more you know more conservative decision making, more fis more frugality, more um, sometimes more sus suspicion of the latest new innovation can be helpful. Like if you're, if you're always shooting for the fences and always kind of on the leading edge of this and that and changing that, it can just, everything can go haywire. And so there's a certain level of 
to be a successful business person, I felt like I needed to integrate more conservative values and how I was thinking. So I at least have that as the range available. Even if I'm trying to create a lot of these positive changes that I'm building upon and respecting the past and what's worked and, and some things that are like, you know, quote, old paradigm actually have a lot of um, vis wisdom and value in them. Yeah. So this is the question I want to ask you. To a Trump supporter or a supporter of the policies or the ideologies of Trump. So, you know, the mass media have done a really good job of perpetuating fear and diverse, you know, and, and divided, dividing us. You know, I'm scared. We need a man in power who's going to protect us. We, you know, we need to divide and conquer as opposed to, you know, be unified. That's dangerous. I mean, that's the, you know, the energy of the campaign. It's the energy of, of why people, you know, are voting for him. What, what would you say if you wanted to give them a more enlightened view? What would you say to these people who are afraid and they, you know, they want to build a wall and they want to divide and separate and conquer? Yeah, well, it's tricky because it, when you, if you talk to people in their, just in their fear place, it's like they, they, want, they want to know the thing, they just want to protect at any cost. And so you have to kind of help people see, first of all, that sometimes what we, what we choose to do when we're fearful, it actually undermines our real sense of safety or security. So, so it's more like saying, okay, well, yes, there's an there's a impulse to protect, but uh, can we do that in a way that actually leaves us more safer, safer in different ways? And so, like, for instance, with the world of Islam, if we, if we exclude all Islamic people that actually can feed into the ideology of discrimination that ISIS is building upon. So their, their whole strategy is they're trying to provoke the West into repressive measures against the Islamic people who live in their countries, and that then those Islamic people are going to rise up, join with ISIS, and create a third world war. They actually want to create a third world war. That's the, the game plan because that's their end times uh, vision of how paradise on earth is eventually created. So, so if we just cave into the fear and do what they're wanting, that actually makes us less safe in the long term. So, so in a way, it's not trying to dismiss the, the danger, but to see is like, is there a higher, a, a more effective strategy to deal with that danger than the one that is, um, and then to gradually, you know, gradually get people to soften their, their fears. You have to, you have to engage uh, in things that, that um, are going to dissipate those fears one way or another. It might be having, you know, watching watching um, videos by people who are Islamic leaders who are denouncing terrorism, for instance. So see, <clears throat> wow, those people are really on our side. Or, you know, so it sort of like feels like there's there's a sense of dissipating the energy that's associated with with the fear. But it's it's hard because you know when we when we descend into our fear brain, it's a more our reptile brain or kind of lower brain centers and, and our decision making is more primitive and it tends to be more literal and reactionary, but it tends to also then create more problems rather than actually solve them. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the you know, Bernie has sort of dropped out of the race and that, and his, his ideology and his policies were giving people a lot of hope who are more about community and oneness. Do you think Hillary holds those same values as Bernie? Is there somebody I mean, else? Does. Is there somebody else that's in the running? Is it no, it's, in fact, the way that we our, our our system is structured, it pretty much devolves to a binary race. I mean, there are third party candidates, but they don't have any chance. So it's effectively, any vote not for Hillary or Trump is empowering one or the other. So it's sort of it doesn't really come down to um, we don't have a system that's designed to support third parties. You kind of that's that's just the way it is right now. Yeah, so, that's how our system works too. Yeah, and so you just have to deal with like, well, it is pretty much a binary choice at this point, and you can choose not to participate, or you can choose to vote for somebody else. But then you're not really tipping the the balance on the the main scales. Um, and so I think what Bernie, you know, Bernie really provided. Oh, to speak to what about Hillary? So Hillary has this whole other side to her that people aren't aware of. She's a meditator. She used to work with Gene Houston. She knows she's known different human potential leaders. She's actually got a whole spiritual side to her. I've talked to people who know her and say, 
Um, she's one of the most generous people you could ever meet. Uh, she's, uh, I talked to a, someone who's friends with her and her friend said, literally every year on her birthday, Hillary send, writes her and sends her a poem of appreciation, a new poem of appreciation for her friend. I mean, the level of conscientiousness and care for other people is quite extraordinary. It's, a very, it's very different than the caricature that's been portrayed. And so if you, if you yeah. really look at it, I'm, you know, there are certainly things that, that are du of dubious uh, value that, um, and, and ethics that have happened through the Clinton Global Initiative and things that she's been involved in. I think there's legitimate critiques. But people fail to like, see that it's like this is an incredibly caring woman who actually really listens to the, her staff. She really listens to colleagues. She'll work with anybody. She doesn't hold grudges for very long. She, like people that like crucified Bill Clinton during the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, she'll like show up and befriend them and like want to work with them on projects. She doesn't hold the grudges from the past. So she's actually been quite resilient to be a woman out in front who's taking a lot of arrows and bullets for being too powerful a woman at a time when people weren't as comfortable with that. So she's taken a lot of hits. There's been a lot of negativity orchestrated against her. She's made some missteps. She's made mistakes. She's done backroom deals that haven't looked good. And, you know, I'm not going to pretend like she's been a saint. But I think she's actually a lot more conscious than people think, people realize. And the people that I know who are, it basically boils down to the closer in that you've talked to people, the higher the opinion they have of her, which is different than a lot of folks. Like, and I, I know in the consciousness movement, it's like you talk to people all the time. Oh, the spiritual guru, they've got, they've got these great images out in the public, but people are really in there like, yeah, they don't really walk the talk. She's kind of the opposite. She has a lot of negativity swirling around her, but the people who are in her, who work for her, the inner circles are like, wow, she is the most amazing, generous, thoughtful, committed, hardworking woman. Even people who used to demonize her, like uh, uh, people from the Obama campaign will work with her and they're like, wow, she's always super prepared. So it doesn't mean, you know, I'm not putting her up for sainthood, but I do feel like she, she is a lot better woman than she gets credit for in the larger public in terms of her ethics. For instance, they did a study, PolitiFact, that was objectively looking at um, statements of different political candidates. And she was, she, was rated, uh, she was rated at pretty much the same level as Obama and actually better than Bernie in terms of truthfulness. Um, so there's this whole thing around her lying all the time. And yes, she's had made some lies, but in actual statistical analysis, She's pretty truthful as far as politicians go, probably 10x more truthful than Donald is, but he's always accusing her of being a liar. So, so there's a way in which I think we have to deprogram when, when people are in a fight, and this is a fight that is fueled by ten, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and deep animosity and the desire for power. And so the level of distortion that can happen in the fight can be pretty extreme as well. It's just like in a bad divorce, it's like all you hear about is, uh, you know, how evil one party is or the other. And imagine that, when, that you know, each of those parties has $10 million to take pot shots at each other. You know, that's part of what goes on in, in the political system. And so we need to mature our political culture and, and the way we do politics. And that's part of why I, I wrote this book is to really chart the pathway for how do we do that? How do we evolve America to fulfill more of our sacred principles so that we're better, that we're actually healthier and more whole and demonstrating a higher possibility for democracy and inspiring people with, a, with, a, with an up-leveled American dream. Right now, I feel like one of the, the negatives that we do to the planet is that we've created a very materialistic um, American dream, which then infects all the other, the dream of what the good life looks like around the world because our media are so influential. So we have to actually upgrade the American dream to the next level where it's more about self-actualization and creativity and, and learning and growth, all these intangibles that don't actually require more stuff and resources which which is depleting the planet so we so we have to up level our vision of the good life what we're broadcasting how we're demonstrating these sacred principles what our democracy looks like and again other other countries we can also be a little more humble about saying where are other countries going beyond us i mean i feel like australia showing the way on gun on gun issues i mean you really you had you had you know mass shootings and you said okay we're taking action and you've you've dropped your your shooting rates way down. And, and I feel like that's a great example. Or Finland with their education systems. Yeah. That's where there's a certain amount of humility of not just saying America's the greatest, but it's like, well, we're, we're great in certain realms and there's other realms we're sucking. And we need to learn from the other countries that are doing better too. <laughs> Look, uh, again, so much I could say to that. The only criticism, I, well, I don't know if it's the only criticism, but the criticism I have of Hillary, not that she's, got, you know, not that I'm in America, so it doesn't really matter. But as I watch is that 
well, really any politician that's a female, is that they become very masculine in order to win the race. And yeah. uh, it's like a shame that they have to become that sort of masculine energy, you know, put that, that's the forefront of their energy in order to compete in this male world. And yeah. why can't the feminine principles of nurture and, you know, bringing the family together, like, be the forefront of their energy? And, and, we, and we see that as a society, as a humanity, as something that we want to lead us, that... So that would be the only criticism, I suppose, or the only well, one of the criticisms. Well, two things. Two things on that. One is that um, we haven't shifted the culture, the political culture, and so, so until the culture shifts with more women and more feminine in the men, that it's it makes it a certain amount that it's like you have to demonstrate toughness and resilience, or else you just get annihilated. I, I've supported two women who've run for Congress, and they both found just the level of uh, uh, attack energy was something that just took so much so many hits on their system yeah, it took six yeah, months yeah. for both of them afterwards to kind of metabolize and clear the damage really to their energy system and emotional yeah. body. Yeah. That happened in Australia too, because we had a female prime minister uh, for a little while and the attacks on her through the mass media were just tenfold the, the, of any man and and the way they attacked her because you know you don't really talk about the hairstyle of a well, trump except for trump <laughs> <laughs> they're wearing or how they're wearing their lipstick or you know it's just the personal attacks that went through because you anyway it, it look it would not be easy to be a woman in politics i i grant you that you know i yeah. i give all women in politics that it's like oh i wouldn't want to do it yeah, that resilience to that onslaught of well, attacks about and then in America, the one other point is that, you know, people, unlike a lot of countries where there's actually more of a separation between the military leadership and the state leadership, I mean, we our commander in chief is the president. So for a good chunk of the American population, they are electing not just a president, they are focused on electing a commander in chief. And, and so there's a need for that aggressive toughness and we tend to as a culture prize that toughness so i mean i think hillary's frankly is about as feminine as american people would elect right now but i think she's actually from what i hear she's actually much softer much sweeter more generous more caring on a personal level but she's kind of had to have developed more of a a tough uh, exterior in order to kind of you know prove herself and get the job done and be respected by you know, CIA, top, you know, top security intelligence people and military people, and, and they do respect her. They, they're like, this is, and they always, they say approvingly, this is a tough woman who knows how to make the tough calls. And that's a kind of a prerequisite right now for that role. I do think that in the future, what we want to have is to be able to elect people who are more fully balanced. And in some ways, that, that may be uh, Obama's uh, bigger gift. He's actually had a more integrated feminine side than most of our uh, mm. presidential, presidential leaders. And so I think he actually brought in a certain kind of a, a decorum, a generosity of spirit. Like he didn't just kind of go toe to toe and slug it out with people. He was very uh, measured and thoughtful and yeah. um, often really willing to consider different points of view. And so I think he's actually got a more integrated feminine than a lot of, a lot of men do. So I think he brought some of that in. Yeah, look, it's a fascinating world we live in and uh, watching the play of our psyche, you know, play out in the political arena is just fascinating. I've never really been into politics uh, um, because as I've watched our politicians and I say our being Australian, there is a show on television that shows them in Congress talking to each other and all they do is throw mud at each other. All they do is criticise each other. All they do is shoot the other party down and it never appealed to me. Every time I turn it on thinking there's got to be something here that I can watch, it's always well, the same thing. It's this, it's this attack of the other side. And so my prayer has been for politics in general is that wouldn't it be great to see a politician that said, you know, the other guy is doing a great job but I can do a better job. Like you don't have to shoot the other person down in order... Right to say, look, they're a terrible vote for me. It, it right. can be like, they do a good job, but let me just tell you about what we can do. I can do a better job. It, right. And it's not that divisive, argumentative. It, you're not yeah. at war. It's not perpetuating this idea that well, we have to be at war with, you know, within our own political party, within our families. It's perpetuating that whole idea of war, which needs to right. 
shift. Yeah, and that's why I, that's why I put you know sacred America, sacred world. It's like we have to bring a deeper, uh, our, our more heart and soul into the political process, and that brings a sort of a, a more of a deep respect for everybody's dignity and divinity, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that my only challenge to you would be if, if you don't like the political culture there, then to be active in it. It doesn't necessarily mean to be active on the election side. It could mean mm-hmm. connections with your whatever your elected officials are and helping them. A lot of them are they're wanting support to to be able to create more enlightened policies. And so, you know, I've, I've been trying to reach across. Um, I built bridges on the left and uh, and, and some on the right now. I've, I got books. I got my book to Hillary Clinton and to Barack Obama, as well as to. Michael Steele on the Republican side, um, various senators. I, I just signed one that somebody's going to bring to Justin Trudeau. Um, some poli- <laughs> British fantastic. So, so, I'm, I'm, so yeah, I'm trying to build bridges on both sides, and you know, and I think that that's part of the growing edge for the spiritual movements is yeah. to say, listen, if we really believe that we are operating from a more unitive perspective, which I think we are, then it's imperative that we begin to help translate that into our political system, because otherwise the world is going to be suppressed by this war culture that's actually not leading to better solutions or a healthy demonstration of what a loving culture looks like. And that gets templated in at a very young age of our children. So we can create our little bubble worlds, but really shifting the, the, the big political game is the most powerful way to create lasting change. It's just harder work and it takes some time, but you know, there's people are, I think there's more open openness and desire for it than than people think as well because a lot of the you know political leaders don't want to play this game anymore. They want to they want to be speaking their heart and soul. They want to do do good for the world. They don't want to be in a you know twenty four seven food fight. Yeah. So you got your book in front of. Have they read those books? Has uh, Obama uh, and. I mean, they probably couldn't even. T- I could. I probably wouldn't find out if they if they had because it's you know. I, I'm 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 enough outside the the uh, paradigm that it, it probably wouldn't it probably wouldn't be good for them to even say they've read it. But I don't, so I don't know. But okay, um, okay so what I, hear- I, I know that, I know that Hillary said, "Hey, oh, Sacred America, I need that," you know, and so and she looked at it and she seemed interested. I have okay. pictures of her receiving it. <laughs> cool, very cool. Congratulations. So, what you would say? This is what I'm hearing. So, I'm one of those new age hippies that wants to see love and light on the planet. We all just get along, and we're moving to a new way of consciousness. And the way that I feel like I can do that is to ignore, you know, the political arena because all they do is fight. So that's been. So that's been- my consciousness, I'm getting feedback. So what I hear you saying is for people like me who want to see a more unified world, a more sacred world, a world of more unity and, you know, a better world, rather than ignoring the crazy politicians and their fights and their stupidity and just saying, I don't want anything to do with that, you're saying get more involved in politics. What can yeah. we do? What, you know, what, what can I mean, we do? One thing you can do, there's a great group called Friends Committee on National Legislation in the United States that is a Quaker group. Quakers have built political engagement into the fabric of their religion in many ways. And so they've been very active in everything from the fight to end to slavery to the um, creating peace in the world. And so they actually work in a bipartisan way in the United States. So we go once a year to to lobby our, our congressional representatives. So if you go on a particular issue. I'm sure there's parallel organizations in, um, in Australia. Just to, just to go and uh, be a, a citizen advocate on a particular issue. It might be a particular bill that's coming through. It's, if you build a relationship with people in, your, uh, in the office of, the, of your representative, it gives you a pipeline in to offer perspectives. I think that uh, somebody like you, if you're a channeler and uh, able to access a lot of higher information, um, figure out a way to just through friends of this get try to get some information through friends to a political leader. If you can get the ear of different political leaders, you can be a conduit for a lot of wisdom to them for how to engage things in a different way. And it might be that it's not something that's ever public because it might have negative repercussions for them. But if you do that behind the scenes, you could have a very powerful influence and still be in a way giving from your greatest gifts. So I think if you um, you know early on, Hillary Clinton took a lot of flack in the when her husband was president because she worked closely with uh, Jean Houston, who is a formidable teacher, great intellect, but she's also works in a very spiritual way. And she got a lot of flack because they were doing whatever seances in the white house. There's became this whole spin of like woo woo in the white house. And so, you know, problem problematic to be fully public with that. But a lot of these political leaders are more 
they're more open to stuff behind the scenes than I think you might think. And so, and so if you can, if you can help to provide deeper wisdom to people, you're valuable. And so if you, you know, it wouldn't take you long if you, if you put your mind to it to probably get connected to some Australian political leaders and just offer your perspectives and, and uh, insights on things too. <sighs> more woo woo in the white house. Look, that, that is, <laughs> hallelujah, more woo-woo in the White House. Look, that is, you know, that's been a thought. I actually, I, I know, I don't know the Prime Minister of our country, but I, I know his, uh, his wife's brother, you know, someone that I grew up with. And so I have a connection. But I, then the ego comes in and says, no one's going to listen to me. I'm this woo-woo person who talks to dead people and talks about aliens and, you know, and I love it. You know, they're not going to listen to me. So that's what my, you know, critical... Well, they're, they're, they may, it may be about getting specific. So what if you just did, started with a session and you just said, okay, I'm going to open to a session. What would be valuable information that I could bring through and that might be valuable for the prime minister and just to see what comes through and, and you don't have to send it. You don't have to figure out how to get to him, but it could be interesting to try to. That's so interesting. So I've had that thought. I have had that thought and I've dismissed it. I've dismissed uh -huh. it because I just think no one's, I am nobody. Nobody's going to listen to me, but that, you know, this is empowerment 101, you know, list your wow. <laughs> well, I think it's just, first of all, seeing that what you have is valuable. And not everybody has that kind of gift, but what, we, what all of us have is an ability to be, if we are more conscious and more clear, oftentimes we have greater discernment. We can see possibilities for action. I just, you know, I, I've been working my way in. I just uh, sent, I did an article on Senator Cory Booker is this really great senator who's up and coming. And they reached back out to me and said, wow, I'd love to connect more with you. I'm in the midst of trying to get in more to Bernie Sanders and his folks. And so, you know, I, I think that all of us can, at the very least, build bridges to our political representatives and try to bring more wisdom into a process. Because right now, if they're, if they're only hearing people from like in the food fight, yes. then they're not actually getting a higher perspective on things. And so those of us who are uh, doing deep practices and opening to a more unitive uh, perspective can, I think, offer real wisdom and sometimes help to bump things in the right direction. In, as an example, we, we did some lobbying with the Friends Committee on Na National Legislation for the Iran deal. Now, the Iran deals definitely get a lot of critique in the U.S., but I really believe it's been important to help stabilize the relationship and not create another World War III. And so the Iran deal, we lobbied on behalf of that. And I can tell like out of the 450 people who lobbied on behalf of that at the national level and in their congressional districts, like it was a close vote in the U S so it probably just bumped it over the top. And so sometimes the difference between peace and war is a, a cute couple of votes. And so if you take the time to build those relationships, um, you know, and I don't know exactly what the next growing edge is for, for, uh, for Australia, but like, you know, you've, I think some of the things I know you've done well is I feel like you've done a more sincere job of reconciling with the Aboriginal pe peoples and acknowledging the, the misdeeds there, but there might be something that's another level of integrating their wisdom into the, into the way things are governed. There might be something about bringing more of the feminine energy and impulse into the political process. There might be ways to encourage that, that, um, that people aren't aware of. So sometimes if you have, if you're, open to higher consciousness, you have more access to new ideas and possibilities. You're less frozen and you have the blinders on of exactly what you've inherited. So, so I think that uh, it, we don't want to under, undermine the value of what uh, people on a spiritual path can bring to the political process. It's just a matter of getting the, shifting the mindset and saying, there's all this legacy that we have where it's like, oh, the spiritual people are off in their little bubble world being very enlightened in ashrams and elsewhere. But yeah. in actuality, what we really need is to have the bridge so that we create an enlightened society. And that's, you know, that's ultimately what creates peace on the planet. Ultimately what creates health and wellness for everybody. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be calling your representative when there's a piece of legislation up and just taking on a spiritual practice to see and building bridges with people that might not, you that you might think would be really not like you at all. I, I took the time to read both of Sarah Palin's books just because I felt like I, I was so I was so negative towards her that I felt like I had to do my inner work and, and actually you know see her with more dignity and respect. Yes, and, exactly. And that was actually 
an important shift that opened me to working more with conservatives as well, because they also have their divine role to play. Exactly. I think the shift in, in, in any of us, especially for the light workers or the conscious creatives or the people who want to see a better world, is to shift that mindset from judgment to acceptance. I mean, okay, these people have these crazy views and they're, you know, they want to create war and divisive, you know, they're divisive and but can you love them for their role? Can you, you know, can you shift your own perspective from you're wrong to as you say, finding that acceptance. Yeah. And that it's, like, it's like having a, like having a 12-year-old boy. I mean, no matter how enlightened you've raised a 12-year-old boy, chances are they're going to be playing shoot em up with somebody else. It's like it's a developmental stage, and we have to kind of love people through that into a more mature, collaborative thing. It doesn't just have, you know, you want to minimize the destructiveness of that phase, but the human race needs to evolve out of that whole phase and move to, like, a healthy, mature, spiritual adulthood. But there's Ooh. still, you know, you just have to... You've just given you've me a great to hold people through it in a yeah. way. You've just given me a great vision. You know, see our politicians as our children, as opposed to our leaders. You know, we're helping them grow up. <laughs> we're That's helping true. them into. On a consciousness level, that is true. I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, I don't want to infantilize them too much. They're often very competent, very skilled individuals as well. But they're, but there's a spiritual maturation that sometimes hasn't happened as much in political leaders because they've. They've had to kind of slug it out and work through the power structures. And so, you know, historically, if you think about historically, the great kings and queens always had a lot of advisors around them. And a lot of times those were very spiritual people who were helping them to evolve their consciousness and make better decisions for the whole. Yeah. And uh, democracy requires the same thing because we want to have the, the wisest people in the culture interfacing with the most powerful. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and uh, as you were saying that, you know, the indigenous of our land, the indigenous of any land have so much wisdom to bring. But when it's the power play of politics, you know, money wins over, over land. And that's been a huge, I mean, we live in this extraordinary land where we have masses of it that's empty. You know, there's 24, 26 million people on this land mass that's huge. And, uh, and yet there's this war, against, you know, the miners and, you know, the Aboriginals are trying to save the land and the politicians are legislating for more money and export and trade and more money. But so that seems to be a big issue within our political yeah. arena. Just, you know, looking for creative solutions. What if, you know, what if the Aboriginal people became stewards of some of the world's largest uh, solar, solar farms in the world that, you know, exported exported energy to other places instead of just mining for coal maybe it's becomes there's like a pipeline of energy that gets you know that it's like on aboriginal land and they thrive and they're kind of looking after i, I don't i don't even know what what the breakthrough solutions are in um, australia but what are, you know what are the advantages of having such probably the you know the lowest population density of any major uh, major economy and uh and what does that actually afford in terms of experiments for how do we create a healthier planet that you can then replicate elsewhere too? I think that Australia can be a good incubator of, of, um, of innovative ways to, to, design a, to design a society because there's simply more space to do so. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's more space, you know, literally, but there's more space in our consciousness too because yeah. even though we have this uh, horrendous history, uh, there is still not as much of it as in Europe or even America because there's not as many people and so there's not as much of it. So there's more freedom and thinking and thought down here. Yeah. But you and know, I, I understand it. It's like you have one of the highest percentages in the world of kind of new paradigm thinking, spiritual but not religious. Religions are much yeah. lower in many ways, but also the new possibilities are much higher. So how does that interface with the political world to create new templates for human civilization? I mean, I think you could be well ahead of where America is on a lot of different fronts in terms of the designing of the new culture. And to think of that as something like, oh, we've got, we've got some space for some really cool experiments. We've got some space to do in psychic space and physical space to do some things that are very pioneering a new pattern for human civilization that might be harder to accomplish, you know, because U.S. is so hung up on our, our military might and all of that. And it's like, you're just kind of done with that. You know, you're, I mean, it's not as big of a focus for Australia. So, you know, you have a level of, um, 
affluence that's already very impressive. And so it's like to translate that into pioneering a new possibility for humanity. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've given me a lot of food for thought. So I hope that people watching this are having as much, you know, food for thought as I am as a person who, you know, says that they're conscious because, you know, really it's been, I don't want anything to do with those crazy people. And uh, that's not the way to go about it. You, yeah. you have to take care of your children. <laughs> I love that. You know, don't see them as, uh, see them as children that are growing up. See them as 12 year olds that just need to find, find their way. Sometimes they might need a timeout and sometimes they <laughs> need to have their toys taken away, but they're, yeah. just, they're just growing up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about the Shift Network, but we'll, uh, we'll do that another time. It's right. been such a joy and such a pleasure and so enlightening talking to you today, Stephen. It's been great. And so what would you like to leave people with? I suppose you want everybody to read your book. Yes, read the book. Uh, if you're in Australia, come up with your own version of what does it look like for Australia to go to the next level. So I think it's important that we activate visions of what's possible and then pathways for how do we make it real. So that's what I've done in my book. And some of which would apply in Australia, some of which wouldn't. And so, and so I think each country has its gift to the larger shift on planet Earth. And to think about what's our individual role within these larger gifts of countries and in creating a, a world that really works for all. And just hold the torch of, of possibility. I really believe that we are going to create an, an enlightened civilization on this planet, that we are going to create a world at peace, and that we are going to uh, create a, a sustainable world. And that all of us have our role to play in that. And part of it is to take responsibility for, for being part of the evolution of the political system as part of our spiritual practice, as part of our commitment to the larger whole. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, just thinking about so many things, you know, all at once. You've just given me so many ideas that are... Thank you so much for talking to us today and uh, blessings. <laughs> Thanks to you. Great to meet you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now.